What does it mean to live an infinite life? Clearly, our lives are finite. We're born, we die, we come, we go. But life is infinite. The game of life will continue with us or without us. We don't get to choose the nature of the game. Life is infinite. We don't even get to choose if we want to play in the game or not. Once you're born, you're in it. We get one choice. Do you want to play with a finite mindset? Or do you want to play with an infinite mindset? To play with a finite mindset means waking up every day and say, I'm going to be the best. I'm going to be better than everybody else. I'm going to accumulate more power, more responsibility, more money, whatever it is, whatever, you, whatever your metric is, I'm going to get more than anybody else. Me. And when you die, you take none of it with you. Or we can choose to live our lives with an infinite mindset, which means I'm going to leave this world, this school, in better shape than I found it. It means I'm going to devote my life to see that those around me rise. We've all had teachers, and some of you are those teachers, where 20 or 30 years from now, I can go to one of your students and say, you're a remarkable human being. You've accomplished so much in your life. How did you become the person you are today? And they will tell me your name. We all remember the teacher who believed in us. We all remember the teacher who had our backs. We all remember the teacher who saw something in us that nobody else saw. And that's what it means to live with an infinite mindset. It means we devote ourselves to that mindset for everyone in our lives. That other teachers will say that about us. Other principals will say that about us. Other students will say that about us. Our friends will say that about us. I am who I am today because of you. And I will commit to live the same life that you taught me how to live. And you will literally live on beyond your own lifetime. When you're gone, others will carry your work for you. This is what it means to live an infinite life, and it is just a choice. I have five little rules that you can follow as you find your spark and bring your spark to life. The first is to go after the things that you want. Let me tell you a story. So a friend of mine and I, we went for a run in Central Park. The Roadrunners organization, on the weekends, they host races. And it's very common at the end of the race, they'll have a sponsor who will give away something, apples or bagels or something. And on this particular day, when we got to the end of the run, there were some free bagels. And they had picnic tables set up. And on one side was a group of volunteers. On the table were boxes of bagels. And on the other side was a long line of runners waiting to get their free bagel. So I said to my friend, let's, let's get a bagel. And he looked at me and said, ah, the line's too long. And I said, free bagel. And he said, I don't want to wait in line. And I was like, free bagel. And he says, nah, let's, it's too long. And that's when I realized that there's two ways to see the world. Some people see the thing that they want, and some people see the thing that prevents them from getting the thing that they want. I could only see the bagels. He could only see the line. And so I walked up to the line, I leaned in between two people, put my hand in the box and pulled out two bagels. And no one got mad at me because the rule is you can go after whatever you want. You just cannot deny anyone else to go after whatever they want. Now I had to sacrifice choice. I didn't get to choose which bagel I got. I got whatever I pulled out, but I didn't have to wait in line. So the point is, is you don't have to wait in line you don't have to do it the way everybody else has done it. You can do it your way. You can break the rules. You just can't get in the way of somebody else getting what they want. That's rule number one. Rule number two, sometimes you're the problem. We've seen this happen all too recently with our new men of science and empirical studiers and these men of finance who are smarter than the rest of us until the thing collapsed. And they blamed everything else except themselves. And my point is, is take accountability for your actions. You can take all the credit in the world for the things that you do right, as long as you also take responsibility for the things you do wrong. It must be a balanced equation. You don't get it one way and not the other. You get to take credit when you also take accountability. That's lesson two. Lesson three, take care of each other. You want to be an elite warrior, it's not about how tough you are, it's not about how smart you are, it's not about how fast you are. If you want to be an elite warrior, you better get really, really good at helping the person to the left of you and helping the person to the right of you. Because that's how people advance in the world. 
The world is too dangerous and the world is too difficult for you to think that you can do these things alone. If you find your spark, I commend you. Now who are you gonna ask for help and when are you gonna accept help when it's offered? Learn that skill. Learn by practicing helping each other. It'll be the single most valuable thing you ever learn in your entire life. To accept help when it's offered and to ask for it when you know that you can't do it. The amazing thing is when you learn to ask for help, you'll discover that there are people all around you who've always wanted to help you. They just didn't think you needed it because you kept pretending that you had everything under control. And the minute you say, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm stuck, I'm scared, I don't think I can do this, you will find that lots of people who love you will rush in and take care of you. But that'll only happen if you learn to take care of them first. Lesson four. Nelson Mandela is a particularly special case study in the leadership world because he is universally regarded as a great leader. And he was asked one day, how did you learn to be a great leader? And he responded that he would go with his father to tribal meetings. And he remembers two things when his father would meet with other elders. One, they would always sit in a circle. And two, his father was always the last to speak. You will be told your whole life that you need to learn to listen. I would say that you need to learn to be the last to speak. I see it in boardrooms every day of the week. Even people who consider themselves good leaders, who may actually be decent leaders, will walk into a room and say, here's the problem, here's what I think, but I'm interested in your opinion, let's go around the room. It's too late. The skill to hold your opinions to yourself until everyone has spoken does two things. One, it gives everybody else the feeling that they have been heard. It gives everyone else the ability to feel that they have contributed. And two, you get the benefit of hearing what everybody else has to think before you render your opinion. If you agree with somebody, don't nod yes. If you disagree with somebody, don't nod no. Simply sit there, take it all in, and the only thing you're allowed to do is ask questions so that you can understand what they mean and why they have the opinion that they have. You must understand from where they are speaking, why they have the opinion they have, not just what they are saying. And at the end, you will get your turn. It sounds easy, it's not. Practice being the last to speak. Number five, remember this. As you gain fame, as you gain fortune, as you gain position and seniority, people will treat you better. They will hold doors open for you. They will get you a cup of tea and coffee without you even asking. They will call you sir and ma'am and they will give you stuff. None of that stuff is meant for you. That stuff is meant for the position you hold. It is meant for the level that you have achieved of leader or success or whatever you want to call it. You can accept all the free stuff. You can accept all the perks. Absolutely, you can enjoy them. But just be grateful for them and know that they're not for you. I remember getting off the Acela. I took the Acela from New York to Washington, D.C. And I got off the train like everybody else. And I was walking down the platform like everyone else. And I walked past General Norty Schwartz, who used to be the chief of staff of the United States Air Force, the head of the Air Force. And here I did you see a guy in a suit, schlepping his own suitcase down the platform just like me. And just a couple months ago, he was flying on private jets and he had an entourage and other people carried his luggage. But he no longer held the position. And so now he got to drag his own suitcase. The real job of a leader is not about being in charge, it's about taking care of those in our charge. And I don't think people realize this, and I don't think people train for this. When we're junior, our only responsibility is to be good at our jobs. That's all we really have to do. And some people actually go get advanced educations so that they can be really good at their jobs. And you show up, and you work hard, and the company will give us tons and tons of training how to do our jobs. They'll show us how to use the software, they'll send us away for a few days to get trained in whatever it is that we're doing for the company. And then they expect us to go be good at our jobs. And that's what we do, we work very hard. And if you're good at your job, they'll promote you. And at some point, you'll get promoted to a position where we're now responsible for the people who do the job we used to do, but nobody shows us how to do that. 
And that's why we get managers and not leaders. One of the great things that is lacking in most of our companies is that they are not teaching us how to lead. And leadership is a skill like any other. It is a practicable, learnable skill. And it is something that you work on. It's like a muscle. If you practice it all the days, you will get good at it and you will get, become a strong leader. If you stop practicing, you will become a weak leader. We all have the capacity to be a leader. Doesn't mean everybody should be a leader. And it doesn't mean everybody wants to be a leader. And the reason is because it comes at great personal sacrifice. When everything goes right, you have to give away all the credit. And when everything goes wrong, you have to take all the responsibility. It's things like staying late to show somebody what to do. It's things like when something does actually break, when something goes wrong, instead of yelling and screaming and taking over, you say, try again. What's the millennial question? Apparently, millennials as a generation, which is a group of people who were born approximately 1984 and after, are tough to manage, and they're accused of being entitled, and narcissistic, self-interested, unfocused, lazy. And because they confound leadership so much, what's happening is leaders are asking the millennials, what do you want? And millennials are saying, we want to work in a place with purpose, we want to make an impact, we want free food and bean bags. Somebody articulates some sort of purpose, there's lots of free food and there's bean bags, and yet for some reason, they are still not happy. There's a missing piece. I can break it down into four pieces. One is parenting, the other one is uh, technology, the third is impatience, and the fourth is environment. Let's talk about parenting first. Too many millennials have grown up subject to what has been described as a failed parenting strategy. Too many of them were told as they were growing up that they were special, that they can have whatever they want just because they want it. They got medals for coming in last. They got participation medals. We know that it devalues the feeling that somebody who works hard and comes in first place, and it actually makes the person who comes in last embarrassed because they know they don't deserve it. So it actually makes them feel worse. It actually doesn't help. There are a lot of kids who got into honors classes, not because they deserved it, but because their parents complained. And they got A's not because they earned them, but because the teachers didn't want to deal with the parents. Then those kids graduate and they start a job. And in an instant, they find out that they're not special, that you don't get anything just because you want it. You get nothing for coming in last, and your parents cannot help you get a promotion. And in an instant, their entire self-image is completely shattered. And so what you find is that there's an entire generation growing up with lower self-esteem than previous generations. Then we add in technology. There's a chemical in our body called dopamine. Dopamine is responsible for the feelings we get when we find something we're looking for or we accomplish something we set out to accomplish. You know that great feeling you get when you cross something off your to-do list, or when you win the game, when you hit the target? Other things that release dopamine include alcohol, nicotine, gambling, and it's the root of a lot of addiction. Now we also know that dopamine is released with cell phones and social media. So that bing, buzz, buzz, flash, and beep that we get from our phones that feels so good, it releases dopamine. It, we like getting it. So now we have a young generation with basically unfettered access to social media and cell phones. We have age restrictions on alcohol, we have age restrictions on smoking, and we have age restrictions on gambling. We have no age restrictions on this other dopamine-producing device called social media or cell phones. And so what's happening is it's becoming hardwired where our young generation isn't learning the coping skills and coping net mechanisms to turn to another human being when they're struggling or stressed, they're turning to social media or their cell phones. You add in the next one, impatience. This generation is often accused of being entitled. They're not entitled, they're impatient. How did they grow up? They grew up in a world of instant gratification. You want to buy something, you go on Amazon, it shows up the next day. You want to watch a movie, you don't check movie times, you just log on and download it whenever you want to watch it, stream it. In fact, if you want to get hold of somebody, you don't leave a message on their machine and wait four hours for them to get the message and call you back. You just text them and they'll call you, they'll get back to you literally instantaneously. They have falsely applied the instant gratification model to life fulfillment and career fulfillment. They want it all instantaneously. The problem is life, relationships, career are not destinations. That's not how it works. It's not a, it's not a scavenger hunt. It's a journey. 
And then we get to the fourth and most egregious of the four observations, environment. We're now taking this wonderful, smart, idealistic, ambitious, hardworking, good group of people that were dealt a bad hand and we're putting them in corporate environments that do not care about them as human beings. Do you know the quickest way to destroy trust and destroy cooperation in a business literally in one day? Lay people off and everyone gets scared. The company has just communicated to everybody else, this is not a meritocracy. We don't care how hard you work or how long you've worked here. If we miss our numbers and you happen to fall on the wrong side of the spreadsheet, I'm sorry, we cannot guarantee employment. In other words, we come to work every day afraid. And we're asking our youngest generation to work in environments where how would any of us ever stand up and admit, I made a mistake. All of these things no one would ever admit inside a company because it puts a target on your head in case there's another round. And so we keep it to ourselves. We've literally created cultures in which every single day everybody comes to work and lie, hide, lies, hides, and fakes. And we're asking our youngest generation to work and succeed and find themselves and build their confidence and overcome their addiction to technology and build strong relationships at work. We're asking them to do this and these are the environments we've created. What are we doing? The point is, is we now, in industry, we now have a responsibility to make up the shortfall and to help this amazing, idealistic, fantastic generation build their confidence, learn patience, learn the social skills, find a better balance between life and technology. Because quite frankly, it's, it's the right thing to do. This is what empathy means. It means if there's an entire generation struggling, maybe it's not them. We're not asking these questions. We are not practicing empathy. We have to start by practicing empathy and relate to what they may be going through. And it will profoundly change the decisions we make. It will profoundly change the way we see the world.